So the next speaker is Alexander Zhiboyedov from Harvard. First, I would like, of course, to join other speakers and thank uh, the organizers for this absolutely amazing meeting and um, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Uh, my work uh, is a continuation of the, the, the project we started last year with uh, Simon, Zohar, and Amit, and uh, it was presented by Zohar last year at Spring 2016, and uh, my today's talk will be based on a work together with Amit, which should appear soon. To motivate the problem, let me start and recall, maybe some of you remember that at Strings 2014, Andy Strominger gathered a list of questions or homework problems from the speakers, and there was a homework, homework problem from Juan, which went like this. Uh, what is the general theory of weakly coupled interacting higher spin particles? That was the question, and there was a related question also by Nima. Uh, how to weakly couple complete gravitational amplitudes. Let me explain first what this question means, why is it interesting, and where we stand. So for the purpose of my talk, to solve this question would be to find a 2 to 2 scattering amplitude, a function of two variables, minus some variables s and t, which satisfies the following uh, remarkable properties. First, weakly coupled means that it is meromorphic. We have exchange, we're exchanging particles of some masses, so we have poles and the positions of the masses of exchange particles. Second, that is unitary. At tree level, it means that the residues are sum of Legendre polynomials with uh, positive coefficients. Uh, the fact that it interacts in higher spin means that we exchange this involved particle with spin higher than two. And at the last, we have crossing. If you want to find uh, this amplitude, it's not that hard. What makes the problem non-trivial is a high energy limit. So imagine you exchange a particle of spin J naught. We would like to assume that there is a such a variable, such a value of t naught, that the amplitude decays faster as s to the j naught. And this is, of course, is a clash with naive unitarity. If we have Legendre polynomial of spin j naught, the amplitude will grow like s to the j naught. And as usual, it's, uh, it's very constraining, and that is the source of non-triviality of the problem. That's a similar story was in the like, talk by Simon, which led to analyticity and spin here. It's similar. There is also a somewhat standard assumption, which we will make, but we don't have to make, is that there is no accumulation point in the spectrum and number of particles with mass less than something is finite. And uh, so to answer the question would be to, f to present the whole set of amplitudes to classify all the functions which satisfy these properties. So that would be uh, to answer the, the post question. What do we know about the set of solutions to this problem? Well, we know that it's infinite. Uh, the prominent solutions are just the usual strings or large n confining gauge theories. We know only one, morally one, solution explicitly, which is Veneziano amplitude and its cousins, Verasoro Shapiro, the sums of Veneziano amplitudes. But among this family, we also know that this amplitude is extremely non generic. So it has uh, exactly linear regular trajectories, it has a degeneracy in the spectrum. So it is, a, it is a representative, but it's not a typical representative. Notice that this problem is a bootstrap in nature because there is no weak coupling, there is no Feynman diagrams, so we cannot resort to any of those convenient tools. So how do we proceed? Well, let me note first that uh, there is a notion of rigid trajectory, this power law uh, that governs the amplitude at high energies. And in string theory for the Venetian amplitude, this rigid trajectory is exactly linear, and note there are two regions, the sort of red one, which controls the spectrum of resonances, and it's supposed to be blue, which controls the real scattering. On the other hand, if we consider Young-Mills, uh, here it is expected to be also linear, but here it behaves very differently. So your naive uh, guess would be that this region is non-universal, whereas this region has a chance for universality. Since we are solving the bootstrap problem, the first step is always to identify the universal region where we can, we can rely on general principles. More generally, if we consider Mandelstam plane, we can talk about scattering at real angles, which is denoted by blue, and scattering at imaginary angles. So scattering at real angles, based on what I said, we expect to be highly non-universal, or at least less universal, whereas in the red region, which is scattering at imaginary angles, we expect some universality and we will bootstrap the amplitude in this region. That's the main idea. Now, to proceed, we need a small parameter in the problem. 
what would be the small parameter? Well, and let me formulate the results. So the, the small parameter will be high energy limit. So the ener we will expand amplitudes in one over energy. And the first result was that uh, among this class of all solutions to this problem with this assumption, the leading asymptotic is uniquely fixed. And uh, since we know one representative, it has to coincide with the limit of the Venetian amplitude. And that was the subject of Zohar's talk. How do you bootstrap this result? This amplitude grows like energy squared times log e. But by itself, if we provide the leading solution, it's highly unsatisfying because if you want to exp make a systematic expansion, we need a tool to compute the correction. Otherwise, what, how, how reliable is it? And that's the subject of the talk. So here's a new formula, uh, which we believe is a unique correction to this formula, which grows with energy. So we cannot check it among any explicit results, but uh, that's a universal correction to the amplitudes in this class, which grows like e to the one half times log e. Here, k stands for the elliptic integral of the first kind, which is standard. Uh, this little m is a new scale which enters in the problem. And uh, the, on the, uh, the string side, it corresponds to massive endpoints, whereas uh, microscopically, as we will see, it corresponds to spectrum sensitivity of spectrum non-degeneracy. Remember, I told you that the spectrum was degenerate. It's very degenerate for very sorry level amplitude. And then we expect, of course, uh, further corrections, which will be non-universal when depend on the theory. So that's, uh, that's a new formula. Let me now expand on the physics of this. So the leading solution, well, first note that the amplitude is exponentially large. And this is a sort of underlying mechanism for universality, and it's a consequence of uni unitarity. Moreover, the amplitude is stringy. It has infinitely many asymptotically linear rigid trajectories. And if you go to the impact parameter space, you see that it corresponds to some exchanging of some non-local object which, whose size grows like log s. And this is known as the transverse spreading of the string. Uh, and moreover, uh, in our analysis, we were to the leading order, we are insensitive to the microscopic spectrum degeneracy and non-degeneracy. On the other hand, this correction, uh, as I said, on the wall sheet, it corresponds to slowdown of the string endpoints. And people study the strings with massive endpoints uh, a long time ago, starting from Chodas and Thorne. And it corresponds to the correction to the leading to the rigid trajectory with t to the one quarter. And I will talk about it more further. And on the bootstrap side, it will correspond to the removal of the spectral degeneracy. So for Venetian amplitude, all the rigid trajectories are related to leading by, shift, inter, by the shift by an integer. Here, it will not be the case. So let me now uh, proceed to how do we compute this correction. The, I will do it in three parts. And not maybe I found it convenient uh, to do this. First, I will describe your a computation. Uh, which will spit out this result. Then I will motivate this computation using a uh, holographic picture and effective field theory of long strings. And then I will present the bootstrap analysis. So we keep in mind always we have the same object amplitude, but it will take very different shapes in different parts of the talk. Okay, so let me remind the famous result by prominent members of the string family, which is that uh, the high energy limit of the uh, scattering amplitude uh, at fixed angles is controlled by a classical solution. And uh, again, let me reiterate that real scattering angles amplitude is exponentially small, and it corresponds to the very fine-tuned nature of uh, free strings. Whereas for imaginary scattering angles, amplitude will be exponentially large. Let me spell out the computation. We start with a free string. The, we inject some momentum. The general solution on the wall sheet is some of the propagators, then we uh, solve the Rossori constraint, so extremizing the action which gives the scattering equations, which were mentioned today. Then you plug it in, you get the famous Grossman de formula. Now, how do we get the next one? Well, we add a mass. Uh, we add a, a massive endpoint, and the crucial thing about this is that uh, it makes the problem highly nonlinear. Notice that the second term is highly nonlinear, and that's why the string is so hard. There are no exact solution known, so apart from trivial one. There is no easy quantization known, as, as far as I know. So it's not clear what to do with this problem. Moreover, if you want to build a perturbation theory in M, you notice that this, the zero term is 
So your starting point is a bit singular because uh, we want to exp we, when we add a mass, the string slows down, but the, to zero order it moves with the speed of light. So the denominator is zero. You can see and convince yourself after thinking about it that uh, the expansion reorganizes itself in, in terms of square roots of m. So you take this expansion, you use some tricks, you then evaluate the action, you find that the first correction and second corrections are zero, the third correction is a non-zero one, uh, and then uh, the result is that the on-shell action evaluates to the gross mender solution plus this correction two-thirds, which comes from sort of virial theorem. It requires some work, but believe me, it's a result. And this is the length of the boundary, which is uh, given by this expression. It's the fourth root of this uh, expression. So what do you do? You, how do you use this formula? You take gross mender solution, uh, you plug it here for endpoint pa particles, and uh, you get the correction. You may wonder if this is a reparameterization invariant. It's not obvious, but it is. It, it's a remarkable property of this gross mender solution. And uh, for four external particles, it gives you this. That's what I told you, this elliptic functions. Now this formula will have many remarkable properties, as I will explain. You can also go to higher orders, uh, but this will be suppressed by energy. And uh, on general bootstrap arguments, this, you don't expect this correction to be universal. You can play with this model, but going back to this class of weakly coupled interacting hard spin series, it's not, it's not so interesting. Okay, so uh, here is the result. It uh, has manifestly ST crossing symmetric. You just change S and T. But it has another great property. What about SU crossing? It is not obvious that it is. Well, for the first line, it's sort of almost obvious. But the statement that it does has this property is that the real part of the, um, um, of the amplitude, when you change S to U, stays the same. You may wonder, why is it, uh, why is it so? Where in the language of, on the world sheet, this S to U transformation corresponds to flipping of, uh, two, say, particles two and three, and you cannot continuously do that to change this ordering. So string theory, and actually string, uh, achieves this, this interesting property in a very interesting and stringy way. So if you start with a wall sheet, so uh, color the boundaries, and you start doing analytic continuation, here's what you get. Uh, when you analytically continue, it, the amplitude develops imaginary part. This imaginary part corresponds to insertion of the Lorentzian solution of the rotating string, which rotates the wall sheet by angle pi. And then the, at the end of this analytic continuation, you get back the Euclidean solution where the, where the points two and three got interchanged. So actually, that's how it is. So if you follow the boundary, the ordering is preserved. But uh, if you just look at the Euclidean solution, it looks like it was flipped. So here is uh, another way to say there is a symptotic SU crossing, which is of stringy nature. It's the emergent symmetry. That the double discontinuity of the amplitude is zero. If you analytically continue to the U channel below or above, it is the same as the original. This will, we will use it later. Now, uh, what about universality? Well, you can ask, yes, why is this correction universal? And moreover, why is a mass events model physical? Why do we care about, uh, why do we care about it? And we can, we can motivate it by several ways. Let me first uh, use a holographic argument. So the generic holographic background is believed to be a, a Minkowski space with a warping factor with an extra dimension. So we have a holographic radial direction in the vertical axis, x on the horizontal one. In, AD, in the UV, we have uh, ADS geometry. And in the uh, IR, the geometry cuts off somehow. But we don't care about the details so much. Now the crucial observation and the great picture to explain why we have this universality is an argument uh, first put forward by Polchinski and Strassler. I called it Polchinski Strassler mechanism. What is the Polchinski Strassler mechanism? We, let's imagine we add a flavor brain. And uh, uh, it's a space-filling brain. It uh, goes from infinity to say some position or not. Mesons are open strings which enter this brain. And we consider scattering of mesons. The observation of Polchinski Strassler is the following, that when you consider real scattering angles, the wall sheet probes the UV part of the geometry. But if you do the imaginary scattering angles, the wall sheet falls into the horizon. So, and now when we take the energy to be large, well, that's what happened to the string. We take this characteristic U shape. So here, you, here we are. Uh, this uh, piece of the string, which uh, effectively explores a flat space geometry, produces us 
this leading uh, cross Mendes solution. But there is a second part, which is the vertical part of the string. And if you leave it sort of on this brain, this is a, like a constituent mass, massive endpoint. So here I assume that this piece is classical. It's a long string, m squared times alpha is much larger than one. So that's a holographic argument that when we take the energy to be large, uh, the holographic model for the purposes of the scattering ampl amplitudes effectively reduces to the string with massive ends. So we can only trust it in this, in this regime. And uh, moreover, to the, uh, to the leading words that we are working, it's insensitive to what's happening to the string here. We just have some energy which slows down the string. Moreover, since we have long strings here, we can ask what do we expect from the, based on the effective field theory of long strings. And many people in the audience, uh, in particular, well, starting from Andy, then Offer with his collaborators and Sergey, thought about this problem. And uh, so if we consider, let's first consider open strings. If we add boundary corrections in the paper by Hellerman and Swanson, they analyzed and they found that there is a unique correction that corrects the regular trajectory. And it's exactly this massive endpoint correction. Uh, then if we consider quantum correction, say it's known again that this polchinski strominger term is universally induced from this holographic direction. Again, we have the same picture that uh, it, it leads to, it induces a massive endpoints, and unless you tune them to zero, they will be generated in the effective action. And finally, it's not done, so hopefully somebody in progress, but if we imagine a closed string, we have these faults, which are singular, and again, you might expect that the leading correction, whatever it is, will resolve these faults. Um, yeah, it was not shown so far. And then as soon as you resolve these faults, again, the physics is the same, that we're slowing down the string, so we expect go back to this massive endpoints. So actually, based on the effective field theory of long strings, we expect that this correction that was derived as this classical picture is much more general and uh, universal. So that was a uh, motivation from uh, uh, this holography and effective strings. Let's move to the bootstrap. So now we forget about uh, we forget about wall sheet. We forget about uh, holography. We are back to our meromorphic amplitude. And uh, what we did uh, last year, we consider this, uh, it's sort of thermodynamic li uh, uh, limit in nature of the amplitude. And uh, what happens is that, first of all, if you l think of Legendre polynomials, we're sitting here. Where they don't oscillate, they are large. And that's why the amplitude becomes large and universal. No matter how you tune them, they cannot, they just sum up. So all residues are positive. This leads to the fact, together, this is just a consequence of unitarity, that uh, if you look b between the poles, there is at least one zero between every two poles. And actually, if you go far away, there is exactly one zero between every two poles. So there could be no more zeros, and, but there could be more zeros. So this is a S plane, the red dots are poles and zeros. But there could be extra zeros, and we call them excess zeros. Uh, so that's exactly what happens, uh, that in the language of scattering amplitude, this cl classicalization, this emergence of the classical world shit, is a, is a condensation of the success zeros from Legendre polynomials that we study. And to study them, and the number of them is uh, controlled by the regular trajectory, and to study the amplitude on this limit is to study the distribution of the success zeros. So uh, that's uh, what we did. We, con we considered the, the, the leading order, the, uh, the amplitude, the logarithm of the amplitude, and uh, we studied the distributions of excess zeros. And uh, the result was that uh, this distribution should, in should inherit uh, the properties of the sum of Legendre polynomials. And remarkably, if you combine an ellicticity crossing and unitarity in this form, so let me emphasize that it has the method we arrived at this expression is completely, completely different. It has, we haven't used any of the Walsh picture. You recover that the unique to leading order, the, the solution is unique, and it's given by a constant density of zeros um, between zero and minus one. So that's uh, somehow should be related to the Walsh picture, but somehow remarkably that's what's happening. Now the problem of the correction is much harder. And why is it much harder uh, is that we start, we start being sensitive to the non-degeneracy of the spectrum. So let's look at this picture. This is, again, an S-plane. There are poles and zeros. So the poles are fixed. They're frozen. They're ions of this problem. And those blue dots are zeros. They're like electrons. And so when we change the T, the zeros move. When zeros sit on the pole, 
we have to reproduce Legendre polynomials. So the number of uh, the number of zeros is controlled by the maximal spin when we see it on the on this pole. Now imagine you move from one pole to another, and imagine I don't know we have larger NQCD and the spectrum is chaotic. So the spin jumps, the spin fluctuates as we go from one pole to another. And to the leading order, the we are insensitive to these fluctuations. But as we consider the correction, we see that if we go from one pole to another, we expect some of the zeros to jump to infinity. And in the thermodynamic limit, they jump to infinity and they come back, and they do in these jumps, they leave traces. And these traces of the non-degeneracy zeros in the, in the language of the distribution of the excess zeros we expect them to be as some supports of zeros that goes to infinity. So that's expectation. And uh, moreover, this density, because, okay, what are these uh, horizontal lines? This horizontal line, it describes the ripples on the Veneziano distribution. So it can be positive or negative. These are small ripples. But these non-degeneracy zeros are new ones, so they have to be completely positive. And it's not obvious if, I, if you look at the elliptic functions that I gave you, but it's a fact that Indeed, if you take this amplitude, you can rewrite it as a, uh, coming from these distributions of zeros, and you find that these di distributions of, uh, of zeros in the vertical line is positive. So these two pictures are consistent. This model that we used, it produces exactly the type of function we expect from the, uh, our microscopic analysis. So, okay, but that's the answer analysis. How do we get the answer? One thing is easy to see, and we, uh, that the unitarity in the ST crossing are not enough. You can easily satisfy this condition, and it's, the problem doesn't look constraining, so we should come up with a set of rules if we want to proceed the game. And the natural rule, as I explained, is to impose the asymptotic SU crossing. So when we go, uh, notice that we, so here the amplitude is large, here the amplitude is also large. So uh, when we continue from here to here, the, the double discontinuity is zero. Another way to say it, this crossing, we expect that it's, we're imposing there is no Stokes phenomenon as we go from here to here. That's uh, the condition we would like to explore. So now, uh, the statement is that let me consider some correction. Uh, so it's from T to the K, to the regular trajectory, and uh, consider the correction to the distribution. This condition that the double discontinuity is zero, it leads, uh, it leads to an integral equation. And uh, the integral equation has this funny kernel. It's actually quite a kernel with very special properties. It, has, uh, it looks like it has poles and singularities, but it's all at the end regular. And we, we haven't found the most generic solution uh, to this equation, but one, one uh, so that's what uh, bootstrap, if you wish, that's what the bootstrap spits you out. We have to solve this equation. But one thing you can easily check is that uh, the correction we found does obey this equation. And the second, you can check that uh, if you uh, analyze the solution to this problem, only k equal to one quarter and three quarter are possible. Uh, we haven't found the solutions uh, for k equal three quarter, but it, you can just show that if they exist, then these values are only possible. So of course, uh, the great question is the solution is unique, and we, we don't know. We, have, we don't have solutions to this problem. We hope that it is based on the holography and EFT. And uh, that's where we are, so let me conclude. So this uh, weekly interacting higher spin world is rich and uh, uh, still largely unexplored. Of course, there is a lot of expectation, but maybe these expectations are wrong. I also was careful to call the amplitudes not strings, but stringy, because um, uh, we haven't shown, for example, uh, that the, the density of states is Hygedorn, which is a smoking gun of strings. And in the old days, you have to go to higher point amplitudes to show that you, we might also hope that we can see it because we start probing the non-degeneracy of the spectrum, but so far we haven't uh, been able to, uh, it doesn't seem to, to be enough. Um, so here I want to draw an analogy with the talk by Fernando Aldai, which is that uh, it's a subject of the analytic bootstrap. He, he used the spin as a crux to expand it. Here we're using the energy, we're expanding at large energies. And it seems to be a sort of upgrade of the usual effective field theory of long strings, where we go from effective theory of strings, we go to the amplitudes. And as often in bootstrap, it seems to be fruitful to combine the microscopic blind expectations with some effective field theory and holography. And the hope will be that there is a you know, systematic expansion. We will have new parameters. But still, it's 
should be, there should be some expansion. Of course, as, as always, again, the bootstrap philosophy, first we learn what must happen, and then we try to look for special occasions, special occasions, and for, for this we need the computer and do numerics, and the special occasions could be presence of the graviton in the spectrum, or that if we know, for example, that deep inelastic scattering uh, asymptotic is governed by quantum field theory, I haven't used that. So it would be great to start exploring this non-universal regime. And let me emphasize again that in Joao's talk, they, they made a connection um, to the conformal bootstrap by putting theory in ADS. Here we made the connection, in a sense, by, by, by considering three-level amplitudes because they have just poles and three-point functions. So the data is very similar. But so far, uh, as far as I know, there are no, it's, this problem is very hard. Uh, or maybe it's easy, but we haven't found the uh, right language. Another uh, connection would be to do the bootstrap in ADS. And here, the natural language is null in space. And uh, remember, I told you that there are, we consider theories without accumulation point in the spectrum. In ADS, there are prominent theories with accumulation in the spectrum. The two prominent examples is the 3D Ising model and the SYK model. If you think about it in ADS, it's a theory with accumulation. If you assume that there is no accumulation point in ADS, you can, it's an easy ex exercise, which I will not present, but you can get this famous log S behavior of that Fernando mentioned of analytic, of anomalous dimension. So you can play the same game in Mellon space without accumulation. And finally, uh, of course, uh, ideally, we would like again to study quantum theories. And as uh, Steve Schenker was talking on the first day, and then uh, Joao Penedonis, we expect that at least in some cases, uh, there should be some universal features of quantum, uh, quantum theories, and maybe we, should, we can bootstrap them. And then again, after we are done with what must happen, we can look for special occasions and do the numerics. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Questions? I want to uh, <coughs> add that uh, a motivation to look on strings with massive endpoints is not only holography or the bootstrap, but rather the fact that that is, uh, I believe, the right description of hadrons. So both baryons and mesons uh, look like strings with massive endpoints, and the masses are, are neither QCD masses nor constituent quark masses, but rather string endpoint masses, and I think it's a uh, very interesting. Uh, the system was not fully quantized, and it's a very interesting yeah. project to uh, pursue. Yeah, I agree. So we expect that, uh, well, uh, we expect that this formula, this correction is very universal, so it should be, in principle, applied to you know, large NQCD or... So the number, the number of effective, the number of universal terms in the effective string, string? the number of universal terms in the effective string action depends on the dimension quite strongly. So in particular, in three dimensions, there are many more universal terms than in four dimensions. So you should maybe expect that there would be more universal terms for the scattering amplitude. Right. Uh, for example, also one can think of tuning the m to zero, and then maybe in this case, I don't know, the intercept will be universal. As you said, yes, there might be more, more terms. But uh, this is to be seen, yeah. Uh, do you expect the, these non-universal corrections to lift the tachyon potentially? To, to do uh, what? Uh, to uh, cure the tachyon problem. To cure the tachyon problem. Yeah, and also, would you expect that uh, they will make the, in the non-planar channel, make the spin too massive? That, that would be the hope, right? Uh, can, can you say the last thing? What do we hope? Uh, uh, well, you were uh, uh, referring to ah. this graviton yeah. issue, right? Like, yeah. if you use the large NQCD as, as the prototype, you would expect the graviton to become a massive spin too, yeah. right? So, yeah, here I must say that because we sit uh, very far away and then we're expanding in energy, the fact that uh, uh, the mass is zero or it's small, it's effectively zero, Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, an, of course, an expectation that we have, but at the moment we, we, don't, have, we, we don't see a way to... It, it seems to be that it's sort of the opposite regime of uh, this large energy expansion, and uh, at the moment we don't, uh, we don't see how, how to, to make this expectation real. Yeah. Okay. Since there don't seem to be any further questions, and in lieu of time, let's uh, thank Alexander again.